too. And so uh, it's nice that we have a wonderful group of people that love pouring into our kids. And while they're doing that, I'm just going to put out a, a call because in the next uh, coming weeks, you're going to hear more and more of this call. Uh, we need help in our children's ministry. And listen to me, church. This is one of the most important ministries that we have. And God has gifted us these beautiful children, and we are called to disciple them. And while I love having them in here during the service when we preach on family Sundays, that is not the thing that is most effective for them in coming alongside and partnering with parents so that they can learn. They are learning incredible things, and families are being discipled because kids are being discipled in our children's ministry, they're being discipled in our school. We are seeing the fruit of this. And we need volunteers who would say, I would give one week a month to help out in children's ministry. I know Debbie is desperate for that. And we had, uh, in fact, during the, uh, the, uh, the fast, we heard a testimony of, uh, of one person uh, that, uh, that Debbie was calling out, Lord, we need helpers. And let me just take a moment, too. I wish Debbie were in here. Uh, but she has said, I want to come alongside and head our children's ministry. I feel the Lord is calling me to do that for this season right now. And so I want as much help as possible to come around and support her so that we can make, have it be many hands make light work. And let me tell you guys something, that my life, I was discipled well, not just because I had good parents who loved me and thought that that was important, but because I had a church full of people who loved me and said, that's important, and we're in this together. So as the call goes out for children's ministry workers, I encourage you to answer that call. And some of you say, well, I don't, I don't know if I could, I could do that. Well, talk to Debbie. She's very empowering. And we need help in our nursery, too. We have young families who need that support, and we want to support them. And we have students that can come. So you're saying, well, I don't know, I may need some help. We have student workers and student helpers that will help you in the nursery uh, so that, uh, that we can bless our families, we can bless our kids, uh, and we can do what God has called us to do, which is to faithfully make disciples. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen. Amen. So I expect that there will be plenty of help for Debbie because I know that this is a church that loves to see these kids and wants to see them disciple. Uh, and I'm excited about that. Well, this morning, uh, we're going to jump into uh, our teaching this morning. Uh, and this is a little bit different for me to be holding a mic as opposed to the, uh, to the overhead mic. But that's okay. Uh, we're going we're gonna to roll with it and it'll be just fine. But we're going to open to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. And while you're turning there, uh, I just want to speak really briefly uh, about this particular text. I want you to remember a couple of things. First of all, that this is coming off the heels of Jesus' teaching. We're in the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus has taught us that the way is narrow. We spent two weeks in particular talking about the narrow way. That, that God, uh, God tells us, Jesus himself tells us, the red letters tell us that there will be a narrow way and a broad path. And that the narrow way, few would find it. But the broad path, many would find it. One, the narrow way leads to life. The broad way leads to destruction. Now, we are seeing that in our culture, are we not? We are seeing that very clearly. And we are seeing that all throughout the world and all throughout world history. That it's the broad path, the easy way, that leads to destruction. It's the narrow path that leads to life. But there's also another concern that Jesus wants to share with us on the heels of that. I want you to remember that idea of broad uh, being many and narrow being few because he talks about this in detail multiple times about this idea that false prophets and false Christ and false apostles would arise in the time near the end. And he doesn't just say that some would arise. If we, go to, if we were to skip forward to Matthew 24 and we were to read it there, he says many false prophets will arise in the last days, leading many astray. Now, why that's significant, and we'll get into that today, is because when we start talking about false prophets and, and false Christs and false apostles, these aren't people that we readily identify so easily in the world, is it? Because we can see a lot of that in the world. <laughs> Satan, uh, Satan comes, and people who are practicing witchcraft and divination, we look at that and say, well, that's the broad path, and that's evil, and that's not the way that Jesus has called us to. But when we start talking about false prophets, we're talking about people who may look very much like Christians and even use Christian language. They will use the name of Jesus freely, but they're speaking about a different Jesus. Why? Because they're speaking about a Jesus that looks different than the Jesus from the Bible. 
And so we have to know that that will happen. And Jesus says it won't just be a few, it will be many. And so it's very important that we understand and we listen to this text today. In fact, I'm going to pray before we even read it. Because I don't want these to be my words. I'm not going to speak to you my words this morning. I will commentate some, but I want to speak the words from Jesus that he is teaching us. He is telling us. That's what matters, what our king says. And so we're going to listen to those words, but we want to have eyes to see and ears to hear this morning. So Father, we ask you that you would bless this time. Lord, that you would indeed give us eyes to see and ears to hear and, and hearts to receive what you have from us from your word. Lord, your word is what is true. Your word is what is our anchor. We can hold to it when everything else fails. Lord, your word is the filter through which everything needs to fit. And so, Father, this morning we pray that you would indeed open our eyes to see the truth this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to read from Matthew chapter 7. And, and I also want to proceed this by saying my heart has been deeply provoked. So this isn't just going to be a, a one-week message. The Lord has, has really uh, opened up our eyes in the last few years to see some very specific things. And I think it's my responsibility as a shepherd to share those things with you. It's important that shepherds uh, are, are guardians of the flock, that we help you guys understand and to see uh, the truth. Not that you can't see it from yourself. Every one of you has the ability to read the Bible and to understand it. But it is a shepherd's responsibility to guard the flock. And I have felt an immense pressure, my spirit has been provoked by the things that I have seen and that I have heard of people who are leading people astray, many people astray. And so it's important for me to share this with you guys. So we're going to do a broad overview today from the teaching of Jesus. And then we're going to dive into some specifics next week and possibly even the week after that. But we're going to read this this morning, Matthew 7. If you want to read along with me, if you have your Bibles, and I hope that you do. If not, look on with a neighbor. But Matthew 7, uh, verses 15 through 23, it says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Church, these, I believe, are some of the most sobering words in the Bible. These are sobering words because these are people who said, we did things in your name, Lord. But he says, depart from me. I never knew you, you workers of lawlessness. This is something that we need to heed as believers, as Christians. We need to understand what is Jesus saying here? Who is he talking about? What kinds of things are we supposed to be watching for? These are important words, and we do not want to miss them this morning. So we're going to dive into this. Uh, literally, I'm going to go line by line through much of this today. And we're going to look at exactly what Jesus is saying. And we're going to talk about some broad application as well. But in the next few weeks, we're going to look at some specific application that I think will be helpful to you. Because I think every single person that's in this room, none of us start out to ever want to be deceived, do we? None of us do. None of us want to be deceived. We came here this morning to worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And we want to do that, what the Bible says, in spirit and in truth. We want to worship in spirit and in truth. None of us want to be deceived. And, and I know that most of you come here because you know that we teach out of the Bible, that we are very specific, and we, we do that intentionally, because it's, we don't want man's wisdom, we want God's wisdom. 
And so it's important, and, and that's one of the most important things we're going to see, is that we need to know the Word of God if we're going to watch out and we're going to understand exactly who and what God is talking about. But the good news is this morning, Jesus tells us those answers in the Scripture. The Scripture is sufficient to answer all of the questions that we're talking about today. The problem is when people deviate from the Scripture, that we begin to see these kinds of problems happen. So the best way that we can guard ourselves is to know God's Word. Because that is the filter for everything that we're going to talk about this morning. So I'm going to jump right into this. We're going to start right there in verse 15. We see something very specific. This is a direct and clear warning from Jesus. One he would repeat frequently, especially in the Gospel. He said, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing. So we want to see this reality that this isn't just one time that Jesus warns us. These warnings are throughout the New Testament. There's far more warnings about false prophets in the New Testament than there is in the Old Testament. I don't know if you knew that, but Jesus warns of false prophets who would arise, who would come after, and who would lead people astray. Now, part of the reason for that is in the Old Testament, of course, there were prophets. But there was often one or two prophets in particular that would speak for God to the people. And there were other prophets who would prophesy, and there were times where they would do false prophecy, and God would highlight that, and He would call it out. There were many times where He would say, you have spoken these things that I have not spoken. These are words coming from your own heart. But God had specific men who He would raise up, and He would speak to them. They were godly men who would speak to the people, and we have many of their letters, many of their books that are written to us that are now a part of the holy canon of Scripture. And God used them very specifically. But even then, we are, we are told that, that Israel often even killed the prophets and persecuted the prophets for speaking God's word. But in the last days, we have this picture where we don't have the same kind of structure of hierarchy. God doesn't just speak through one man to all the nation of Israel or speak through one man to all of Christianity. That one man that he spoke through was Jesus who came, that final sacrifice who came. And, and then he gave what? The Holy Spirit to all of us. Because he said, I can't be with all of you at one time, but the Father will send the Comforter and he will lead you into all truth. And so he gave us the Holy Spirit. But we see these warnings that in absence of these specific special men of God who were guardians of God's word to the nation of Israel, we don't have that now. We have the Holy Spirit. But we have this issue that we still have people who would be false. Jesus warns about it multiple times, especially in Matthew's Gospel. If you read Matthew's Gospel, especially here, and especially in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus will warn us several times of this very concern. Paul would warn us in many of his letters that, uh, that people would come in, they would be, uh, and it wouldn't take them long to come in, and they would be like ravenous wolves. Peter warns us, John warns us, all of the writers of the New Testament, the majority of them, warn us of false prophets and people who would come in who would be false teachers and who would lead people astray. I want you to see that this morning. This isn't an uncommon occurrence. This is a common occurrence. And it's been going on since the very day that Jesus ascended into the heavens. There have been false prophets and false people who have spoken and false teachers leading people astray. But Jesus warns us specifically in Matthew 24 that as we get closer to the times of the end, that that would increase. I think that means it's important for us to be diligent. To be diligent as disciples and as believers and followers of Jesus. To not only watch for that for ourselves, but to watch for that for others. God has given us the ministry of reconciliation. And he's given us a ministry to go and make disciples. Jesus gives us this, this and he says, and teach them to obey all that I have commanded you. So part of our responsibility as disciples is to know what Jesus taught so that we can teach it accurately and we can correct others who we love and who we're concerned about, who fall in or maybe fall prey to false teaching. We want to be able to help lead them. But we have to know it if we're going to lead them, don't we? So we see that everybody in the Scripture, especially in the New Testament, is warning us of this. And then I want you to pay special attention to the language here. Jesus said they would come in sheep's clothing. This is one of the most significant statements. And Jesus is letting us know right away that these people will look or sound at times like Christians. That's why he uses the language that he uses. They will come in sheep's clothing. 
These people may look like Christians in speech. They may simply look like Christians in self-identity. Some are far more deceptive than others. Some you can look at right away and say, yeah, you're saying Jesus, but that's crazy, right? And you can do that. And, but some of them are much more subtle and deceptive. In fact, the worst ones are more subtle and deceptive. The obvious ones stand out. You, they, they may look like Christians in some of their actions, and they will seem at times very sincere. I think that's important for us to understand. They may even speak to you in tears and emotion. They may come across as sincere. And this is what makes them so deceptive. And why so many people are led astray. Because they are seeing this and they do not understand the word of God enough to know where those who are, who are subtly deceptive, who come across as sincere, who identify as Christians in their speech, and maybe even in some of their actions. And it becomes deception. And, it, and it's common, very common, from some modern, quote-unquote, Christian movements. So we need to be aware of that. And I don't want you to be worried this morning because we're going to talk about this in depth so that you know what you are looking for. So these next couple of weeks, I encourage you to be here. We're going to talk about, in fact, a couple of specific movements that are the most visible in Christendom today that are leading many people astray. And I want you to be aware of them as a shepherd. It also says, but inwardly, they are deceivers. The language here is ravenous wolves. Ravenous wolves. What comes to mind when we hear that? Ravenous wolves. We might think of predators in particular, that they are predatory. Uh, and when I think of ravenous wolves, I even think of sometimes they're literally ripping and tearing prey apart, right? They're doing great damage to, uh, to the sheep. And also that they are hungry, but not hungry for God. They are hungry for other things, and we'll talk about some of those things, but they are after something other than Jesus and truth. So that's the language Jesus uses, ravenous wolves. And then he goes on to give us some instruction. He says, you will know them by their fruits. We will know them by what they produce. That is what is going to be tested. What they say, what they do, uh, what they claim, we're going to take those and we're going to test those things. That's what we do as good disciples and as good followers of Jesus. We will know them by their fruit. So this isn't something we have to worry that we won't be able to identify them. Some of them may be hard to identify, but we will be able to identify them. We won't be in, uh, led astray if we know what to look for and we know where to go to test those things. But they will produce many things. Some will look good. Some will uh, incorporate a certain amount of truth. And as I mentioned before, uh, that's the ones, the subtly deceptive ones are some of the most difficult. Because the best lies contain enough truth to still be lies, but to deceive, don't they? Those are the best lies, are the ones that contain enough truth and just enough of that's error to still deceive. But ultimately, all of them will produce something false. In many ways, they will deny the biblical Lord Jesus in some way. They will degrade the doctrines of the Bible. They will uh, stimulate greed to try to attract followers and, and prey upon the desires of the flesh and the desires that men naturally have. You might think of Timothy who says, itch, you know, in the, in the letters where Paul's writing and talks about people with itching ears that will heap up for themselves teachers who will tell them the things that they want to hear instead of the things that God has actually spoken. So they will feed off of these things. They're masters at manipulation. They will become very popular, especially with emotionally motivated people. And people will be drawn to them and masses will be drawn to them, which is why it's important that we understand when Jesus talked about the narrow and the broad way. If you see a bunch of people beginning to flock towards something or a movement or somebody, we should be asking the question right away because that should be a red flag that that's really possibly deception that's happening. Because Jesus says, especially in the last days, deception would increase and, and, uh, and we would have, uh, it would be faithful people that would be harder to find teaching the truth of God. They will pervert the gospel and they will pervert grace into something that it was never meant to be. Those are just a few of the signs. And we'll come back to that list uh, near the end. But woe to anyone 
who perverts the gospel. That's what we are told by Paul. He says even if an angel were to come and to preach a different gospel than the one that we preach, they are to be accursed. And then he repeats, he says, woe to those who preach a false gospel. They are accursed. And the other thing I want you to see here is that Jesus uses very specifically a metaphor that we can understand, doesn't he? He's really good at doing that. Jesus is really good about using examples and metaphors that we can understand. So he gives us this idea of a tree that produces fruit. We're supposed to look at the fruit. Don't let anybody tell you that we're not supposed to judge fruit. We cannot have discernment without being able to judge and discern whether or not something is true. And so it's very important that we do not uh, allow them to manipulate and to teach falsely out of this idea that we are somehow not supposed to judge. In fact, Paul says, what am I have to do with judging outsiders? They're already judged. The Word of God judges them. They are already condemned in what they do because they are, they are sinful people who are not under the grace and the mercy and the covering of God. But he says, but we are called to judge those inside, and especially those which publicly stand and proclaim things and, and are trying to build a following and are publicly teaching doctrines. We absolutely should judge those things and make sure that they are right and accurate and true. Don't let anybody try to use Matthew 18 and say, have you gone to them? If somebody has created a public platform and is trying to build a platform and followers, then publicly, if they are teaching wrong things, it should be rebuked. Because if they are teaching wrong things and wrong doctrines, they are leading people astray. And Paul never had a problem ever in any of the scripture calling out individuals who were doing the exact same thing in the churches. Matthew 18 is a personal thing between you and other believers who have wronged you. And especially within the context of a local church. But when we're talking about public people and public platforms, it is absolutely right. And in fact, it is our duty to call out when people with large followings are teaching people and leading them astray. We should be doing that. That doesn't mean you have to go and start a new blog on, uh, online or some video podcast and start calling everybody out in your video podcast. But within the, the circles and the people that you know especially, you should be on guard, watching out for one another. And we should be doing that as shepherds too for the body of Christ. So Jesus uses this metaphor that we would understand, this idea that we are to look at the fruit. He's talking about trees. He's talking about something that is then produced, something that we can look at and we can then discern, is this good fruit or is this bad fruit? And so continuing on in verse 17 through 18, he tells us that even so every good tree bears good fruit, and but a bad tree bears bad fruit, and a good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. So he tells us that we will know them by what they produce. They will produce many things, like I said, some will look good, some will incorporate a certain amount of truth, but ultimately they will produce something false. Jesus uh, also uh, wants to make sure that we understand, actually, I want to clarify something for you here, because Jesus is talking about good fruit and bad fruit, and how one tree can't produce the other, and vice versa. And so it's important that we use the whole counsel of Scripture to make sure that we understand what he is saying. It's important that we understand what he means. It does not mean that a good tree never sins. Okay? So that's really, really important. Because I think all of us understand that, wait a minute, I, th I think at least that I'm a good tree, right? I, I want to believe that I'm a good tree, that I'm following Jesus, that I'm not a deceiver, that I'm not part of the deceived, that I'm following him in spirit and in truth. I'm a good tree, but wait a minute. It says I can't bear bad fruit. Jesus is not specifically talking about this idea that a good tree never sins. The fruit here is not talking about sin in particular necessarily, although obviously it is all sin that is false. It's talking about a consistency of teaching and behavior that is inconsistent with the scripture. It is teaching, for example, that leads people astray from the Jesus of the Bible or towards a false Christ or a false gospel or a man-centered focus that deifies man and lowers the deity of God. That's usually at the heart of almost every false gospel that we're going to look at. You're going to see this pattern where it deifies man and it lowers the deity of God. And it points to something that's false. It always typically points to a false gospel of some kind and often a gospel that begins to add something to the gospel itself. 
Because remember, we've talked about this. The gospel is just Jesus alone. Faith alone in Christ alone, right? By grace alone. We are saved. It's not Jesus plus, now that you're saved, you've got to go do a bunch of things so that you can get into heaven. That's false doctrine. That's a different gospel. Because Jesus says it's by faith alone. And so these will often bring that and incorporate that in. One false teacher that's very, very popular today says that if you don't preach a gospel that includes healing everybody everywhere you go and doing signs and wonders, it's a false gospel. In other words, he's added to the gospel that Jesus just said that nobody should add to it. That is a false gospel. And if you hear that, you should turn away and mark those people and say, I will not listen to anything else they say because they are perverting the very gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. So it doesn't mean that we never sin. That's not what God is talking about here. He's talking about teaching that leads us astray. And, and or lifestyles or things that people do that show that they are not of God. Certainly it can mean sin. For example, we commonly see sexual immorality rampant in false teachers and movements of various kinds. Isn't that interesting that we see that happen again and again and again? And later I'm going to give you an example of just that in a, in a movement that was very, very popular for a time here in the United States and one that has recently succumbed to this very issue. A life of unrepentant sin is not uncommon in false teachers and false movements, and its <coughs> leaders often justify their actions as opposed to repenting. And I'm going to tell you something that's really sobering, and again, I'm going to give you this example at the end as well. But I watched this week a false teacher who taught on how to identify false teachers and was himself already involved in sin, sexual sin within his congregation. And it was sobering to hear him speaking against false teachers and how we would identify them. And he even mentions the very sin that he is dealing with in his life. But he was unrepentant. And he thought that he was above God. And eventually, that sin caught up with him. And not only did it co co uh, catch up with him in that way, but he even utilized the word of God to manipulate his victims. This is devastating things. Devastating stuff. Yes. And they will often justify their actions as opposed to repenting. False teachers are ravenous wolves. They're covetous. They are hungry for gain, be it money, power, fame, whatever it is that is feeding that inside of them. But it certainly isn't Jesus and his kingdom and his righteousness. So we see another warning here in verse 19. It's a sobering one. It's a strong warning. He says, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. That's the warning. It's cut down and it's thrown into the fire. What kind of language does this sound like? It sounds exactly like judgment, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. It's judgment. It's thrown into the fire. This is a transition into the next several verses as Jesus continues to expound upon the fate of false teachers and also of many of those who are led astray by them. Now, I want to, I want to, I want to say something here about those who are led astray. Because often there are innocent people who are, for various reasons, led astray. Maybe they're young in their faith, they're not grounded, they don't know the Word of God. But a lot of the people who flock to false teachers are people who also themselves are, are, have people with itching ears. Those teachers are telling them the things that yeah. they want to hear. Yeah. The teachers are telling them that if you do this, you'll be wealthy, you'll be blessed, you'll have these things, or you'll have this power, or if you come to this conference, we'll impart these things to you, and you can uh, pay us this money. And everybody in that transaction is greedy for gain, aren't they? Don't be greedy for gain. Be greedy for Jesus. Want Jesus. Amen. Want the Holy Spirit. Yes. Want to spend time with Him. Want to know Him intimately. Don't be uh, brought away and led astray by covetous desires in your own heart. Because most of the people who fall prey to these false teachers are people just like that. Many of them are, are no different than Simon the sorcerer in Acts who saw when the disciples laid their hands upon people and they received the Holy Spirit. Simon saw that and he decided he wanted to what? To buy it. He said, how much can, you, can I buy that gift from you for? And Peter rebukes him and he says, that's wicked. Pray that God will be able to, to even enable you to repent so that you do not suffer what's coming. 
In other words, so that you don't suffer this fate where you are cut off and thrown into the fire, Simon. That's wicked. It's wicked, Simon the Sorcerer. But there are Simon the Sorcerers all over in our culture and even in our Christian culture who aren't chasing Jesus. They're chasing other things. And most of them are covetous desires in their heart. So verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. This is a really sobering verse, is it not? There will be people who call him Lord, Lord, who shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father. Remember, this is just following uh, what had simply preceded it before. Jesus is telling us there will be false Christians, too. False teachers and false Christians, people who clearly self-identify as Christians, but who are not saved, and who will not enter heaven. He says it's those who do the will of God who will be in heaven. And let me just encourage you this morning, the Bible is full of verses that say, this is the will of God. It's not that this is in question what the will of God is. These are people who have grown bored with the gospel or maybe who have never truly understood it, but they are not being obedient to the very things that God has actually called them to do. They are chasing after their own desires, their own uh, ideas of what, uh, of what they wanted, and, and creating their own version of Christianity. And that is false, and it is wrong. It is those who do the will of God who will be in heaven. We have to be careful here. We don't misunderstand what this is saying. We need the whole counsel of Scripture so we're not like the cults who turn Scriptures like this into justification for a works-based salvation. The context here is, of course, false teachers, false fruit, and those who follow them and do the same things. When people are saved, there is fruit. There's fruit in their life. Why? Because salvation is transformation. Salvation is a new creation. Salvation is the moment when the Holy Spirit comes into that new believer and seals them and begins to, uh, to do this work of sanctification in their life. Yes. Saved people have fruit. In fact, James tells us if there are not works and there is not fruit, then there is likely not saving faith. He calls that into question because salvation is truly transformation. There is always fruit of some kind. And, and that's true of every single person. There is always fruit. There's either bad fruit or there's good fruit, but there is always fruit produced. So those producing good fruit will be the ones who are entering God's kingdom. And those that produce bad fruit are the ones who will be cut down and thrown into the fire. But I want you to see this morning, there's no middle ground. Every tree produces fruit. The question is simply, what kind of fruit does it produce? Yeah. Is it good fruit? Is there an increasing harvest of good fruit coming from a good tree? Or is it bad fruit masquerading as something that it's not? Verse 22 and 23, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done many wonders in your name? I want you to see that, that they're not just asking and saying, Lord, Lord. They're saying, we actually did these things, these works. Now, I want you to notice something. Many of these works that we're talking about, and this is something that we're going to hit on in the next, uh, in the next couple of weeks, these are works that, uh, that many false teachers and false apostles do. And the Bible itself tells us that this would happen. Jesus himself says that many false prophets will arise and says in Matthew 24, and especially nearing the end of time before Jesus comes back, it says we'll do false signs and wonders. Now, we're, a, we're not a cessationist church here. We are a continuationist church. We believe in the power and the gifts of the Holy Spirit and that God uses those gifts for the work of the ministry to edify the believer. But there are people who will do false signs and false wonders and it will lead people astray. And some of the most concerning movements right now are centered around some of these things. They're doing false signs and false wonders and they're leading people astray. Yeah. And they're doing it in the name of Jesus. Did you catch that? He says, we do these things in your name. That's what false teachers do. He says, and then I will declare to them, I will leave your department, you who practice lawlessness. 
Jesus gets to the heart of the matter in this section, and it is a devastating reality. There are some of the most concerning words in all the gospel. There are, these are words uh, that are being spoken by our king, and we should pay attention to them. He First he says, many, not some, not a few, but many will say to me on that day. This will not be an uncommon occurrence. This will be an extremely common occurrence. Many. Large numbers of false prophets and large numbers of people deceived by them. You've heard the saying that the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Some of the bad fruit produced are those who follow these false prophets and false teachers and are themselves deceived and continue to produce the same bad fruit or continue to pursue their own covetous desires instead of the very will of God, which is so clearly clearly outlined in the scripture. The other thing we need to notice here is that fruit is being produced, but it is bad. If Jesus isn't the source of the fruit, who is? If Jesus is not the source of the fruit, then we need to answer the question, and there's only one answer to that, who is the source? It is demonic fruit if it's not from Jesus. Amen. False fruit, bad fruit, is the doctrine of demons. It comes from one place if it doesn't come from Jesus, and especially because its intention is to deceive. Those who are deceived that are doing that teaching and those who hear their words, its desire and its intent is to deceive. False signs aren't just possible, but clearly there will be many deceived by them, just like when Moses threw down his rod and the Egyptian magicians did exactly the same thing, didn't they? Yeah. The enemy is not powerless. The prince of the power of the air is a deceiver, and he's the best deceiver that has ever existed. And many of these false prophets are trafficking in the demonic, and I mean that in a very real sense. Some of the movements today that are started, that are uh, they have their roots directly, directly tied to the demonic, and it is all masquerading. They have deceived others who are now deceiving others, but its roots are directly from the occult and from the demonic. Yep. That is not good fruit. It's not good fruit because one person takes it and then slaps Jesus' name on it, or their intention is to think that they're doing good things. It's still bad fruit that comes from the prince of the power of the air. The signs are sometimes very, very real. Sometimes they're fake. Sometimes there are people who are doing things and, uh, and they're just deceiving intentionally. They're doing things, but sometimes the signs themselves are very real. And they will appeal to them as proof of their validity. But Jesus tells us in Matthew 24, it doesn't mean that they would actually do that. False prophets would arise. It says that many of them will do great signs as to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Are you hearing the words of Jesus this morning? We have to know then, how do we avoid this deception, if this is so rampant? And I want you to understand, just because something is done in Jesus' name, does not mean that it is of Christ. Deceived people, their job is to deceive people. Deceived people deceive other people. Not all who deceive also do so knowingly. Although I do believe that many false prophets know exactly what they are doing, and they are intentional deceivers who are under the power and authority of the evil one. But many who come under them, who see those things, they're drawn to those things, they run to those things because they think it is a move of God. Many of them, their intention is actually good, but they fall under the power of those who are raised up for the intention of deceiving. Yes. And then they perpetuate that. In the end, God condemns all of them. And he calls their false signs lawlessness. That's another word for sin. Lawlessness, iniquity, witchcraft. Isn't that exactly what these things are? Doing signs that are not from God and attributing them to God. That is taking God's name in vain. That's one of the worst things that we can do is just to ascribe things to God that he hasn't done or he hasn't said. That's taking God's name in vain. That's attributing something to him that he has not done. And is this not also what deceiving people is? It's sin. Deception is sin. Leading people astray, leading people away from God and away from a saving gospel and a loving Savior. Is that not 
sin. That's exactly what it is. That's why God calls it lawlessness. Jesus himself, the red letters, calls it lawlessness. It's wicked because it leads people away from the very one who loves them yes. and who wants to save them. Yeah. Just like you have been saved and, and know the truth. Don't you want other people to be saved and to know the truth yes. too? Isn't yes. that what we want? Yes. That's why this is so important that we would understand and know that there are things happening around us that we would be aware of so as disciples we can correct that when we see it. Notice the very specific statement. I never knew you. These people who are counterfeit, they, they claim to be of God no less, and Jesus says, I never knew you. So it doesn't matter if they use the name of Jesus. It doesn't matter if they think that they're doing something in the name of God. What matters is, does God know them? Is it actually from God? Does he recognize what they are doing and say, yes, this is true? You did these things in my name, but I didn't do these things. That's critical. Because none of us have the power on our own to cast out demons, to heal, to do signs and wonders. None of us possess that power. We don't have it. The Holy Spirit is the only one in us that has that power. We do not. So when supernatural signs and wonders are performed, there are only two possibilities. It's either God or it's not God. And if it's done by the Holy Spirit through saved people, then God knows them. But the alternative is if it's not done through that, then God doesn't know them. I think you can understand that alternative. The alternative, those signs are being done through an unholy spirit and attributed to God by the deceiver. And that is damning because the person is a deceiver and a blasphemer that doesn't know God and will be cut down and thrown into the fire. In our last few minutes together, I just want to share a couple of things that the Lord laid on my heart to share with you this morning. One of them was, I mentioned that there was a very real situation. I was watching it this week. There was a, a false teacher. His name is Mike Bickle. Uh, I want to share this per, per to your example. Uh, because Mike Bickle lead, uh, uh, was lead pastor of a church called IHOP, International House of Prayer, in Kansas City, Missouri. And IHOP was started by a group of men that called themselves, by the way, uh, the Kansas City Prophets. And the Kansas City prophets came together, and, uh, and supposedly there was uh, a prophecy by one of those lead prophets. His name was Bob Jones, not to be uh, confused with the other Bob Jones, who has Bob Jones University Press. So two Bob Jones, don't want to slander one Bob Jones, it's good, okay? But there was another Bob Jones who anointed himself as prophet, and who many people in, in a couple of these false uh, uh, movements actually still think he's a prophet and call him one. This is wrong, this is false, but this is the kind of deception that once people fall under deception or deceit, they can no longer see what is true. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in the next couple weeks, but this particular person, Mike Bickle, it was prophesied that they were to start this church and they were to pray and that they were going to usher in the end times revival. And so they believed that that was true, and so they started this church, and the idea of the church was actually, in one way, it's kind of inspiring. It's kind of like the Moravians, that, hey, we're going to have 24-hour day prayer happening in this place. But it had unholy roots, and unholy roots lead to unholy fruit. And so let me just tell you a little bit about these Kansas City disciples. All three of them now have, have fallen into sexual immorality, deep, deep sexual immorality. The first one, the Bob Jones, uh, who was supposedly the prophet that prophesied many of these things, uh, he actually uh, fell into some deep immorality where he would have women come into his office and he would tell them that the Lord said that they should undress so that they could have a more pure opportunity to hear the word of God. That's from the devil, people. That is not from God. Amen. That is evil. And Mike Bickle, most recently, as I shared with you, I watched uh, a, a sermon of his uh, that was being done because they were, they were talking about the issue of what has happened with him and the downfall of IHOP Kansas City. And they were showing and, and flashing back to some preaching where he was standing in a pulpit, not unlike this one, and he was teaching a church about this uh, exact thing, about false signs and wonders, about false apostles. A few years ago, I had a chance to hear an interview with Mike Bickle, and through the years, his teaching has got further and further from the truth. But he said something about this charismatic movement that often we refer to here as the, as the NAR, the New Apostolic Reformation. Uh, but he was talking about that. He said, you know what, 90% 90, 90 of the stuff that happens in our church, he actually used IHOP Kansas City as an example. He said, 90% of the signs and wonders and things that happen in our church are false. They're people, they're things people, people ate for pizza the other night or any other thing. He said, but 90% of them are false. 
He said, but the 10% that are true, we don't want to invalidate that, so we just allow it all. Friends, I'm going to tell you something. If there is even 10% that's true, I, I doubt that even the 10% is actually true. Because God does not work in environments where people will continue to be deceived by false signs and wonders. Because that's exactly what we're talking about here. These are the people who will be cut down and thrown into the fire. God is not the author of confusion. He doesn't create 10% good and 90% bad and say it's okay. Amen. That's not how he works. And so the people that are flocking to these movements and are caught up in this deception, this is exactly what's happening. And we've seen this now happen with Mike Pickle in IHOP, Kansas City. And if you've ever followed them, you've ever thought, oh, because when I first heard about this church years ago, I thought, what an amazing thing. The church has set up this idea that we're going to be a place, a house of prayer, 24 hours a day. Seven days a week. But if the fruit starts off bad and rotten, it will eventually only produce rotten fruit, bad fruit. And it will destroy the lives of men. And Mike Bickle manipulated many people. In fact, he told uh, one of the women in his congregation, this is what happens, right? They begin to justify their sin and even begin to use all signs and wonders as justification for it. And he would tell women things like, I had a dream that my wife uh, died, and I was supposed to get married to you. And then he would start to enter into relationships with them and manipulate them and deceive them. That's what happens when false fruit is at the heart of what's happening in people's lives, or people are deceived from the beginning. That's bad fruit. But that's a very real and current example of a church that has had a large, large Influence in the current charismatic movement in particular. So we need to be aware. It's people who love God, who love the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you something. There's no downside to the Holy Spirit. There's only upside. Amen. Jesus tells us that we need the Holy Spirit for boldness. We need the Holy Spirit to pray for people. And when God chooses to heal them or do things in their life, we need the Holy Spirit for the gifts of the Spirit that are, that are important for edification of the body and the work of the ministry. The downside is people, and the downside is deception. And so we need to make sure that we understand that, and we guard against that carefully. The answer is not to quench the Holy Spirit. <coughs> that is not the answer. The answer is to have the right filter and understanding and the right foundation for anything that we do and that we seek together. Amen. So, let me just briefly close by talking a moment about discernment. How do we discern? And I hear a lot of people talk about discernment and say, I think I have the gift of discernment. And I hope that you do. And I think in some sense, every believer has the gift of discernment because they have the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. wow. But the gift of discernment is not just the feeling that we get when, when the Holy Spirit prompts us that something may not be right. And sometimes, when we're prompted with those feelings, even sometimes when that happens, we get it wrong. So I want to talk to you about true discernment, or, or maybe what we should aim for when we talk about discernment. I think some of you have maybe had an example, an experience, where you've walked into somewhere, in some place, and you've heard somebody either doing or teaching something, and you looked at it, and something deep in your spirit was provoked. Years ago, I actually had that happen in this church when there was a false teacher that, was, that had come and was speaking in this church. And I was, just a, I was just a young person many, many years ago, long before the current era, 20, uh, well over 20 years ago. But I remember coming and something deep, deep in my heart was provoked. And I was, I was young and immature in my faith. I, didn't, uh, I thought I was strong in my faith, but I didn't understand the scripture very well. So I couldn't necessarily put the words what was wrong. I just knew that the Holy Spirit was telling me, that's not right. And many of you have probably had that exact same thing happen to you before. Where the Holy Spirit gives you a strong sense and understanding. And you realize, you say, that's not right. I may not know exactly what's wrong here, but I know there's something wrong. That's the first step. We have the Holy Spirit. And he often provokes our spirit, sometimes very strongly. And that is a potential component of, a component of discernment like I'm talking about, but it's not enough when we're talking about false teachers and false prophets. The feeling, that concern, it should drive us to the scripture, shouldn't it? Paul does not in any writing or letter call out false teachers and moves by saying, I had a feeling from the Holy Spirit warning me about that person. That's never what Paul does in any of his writings. However, Paul does indeed go to the scripture and expose false teachers and false gospels 
and where and why they contradicted the Holy Scripture so that those in his care would know and would understand what was false. Feelings can be subjective. There are times I've had a feeling about discernment like what I just explained, and it was absolutely true without a doubt, 100% accurate. But there were also times when it was very strong, and, uh, and I could discern quickly that something uh, being uh, taught I thought was not right. And then I went to the scripture and realized that I was the one in error because I didn't like what the scripture was saying or what the Holy Spirit was convicting me of in my heart. There have been times when the Lord has showed me that I was wrong in that feeling. And even though that feeling was strong, listen, Satan is a manipulator. And even though we have the Holy Spirit to help lead us and guide us, the scripture says that he will guide us into what? The Spirit will guide us into what? All truth. Truth. What is truth? What is objective truth? What is the filters, believers, just like Paul and just like the noble Bereans in Acts? Where is this truth that we speak of and go to as the final authority? Friends, it is the Holy <coughs> Scripture. Test all things, John tells us in 1 John. How do we test all things? The Word of God. It is the only sure foundation that cannot be manipulated and changed. It's, it's the canon of Scripture. It's breathed by the Holy Spirit, translated and passed along by faithful men. We have access to truth, and we must know it and avail ourselves of it if we really want to understand what it is to have the kind of discernment that I'm speaking this morning. Amen. I've watched many good people, friends of mine, Bible college students and graduates who have been led astray, who would claim to have great spiritual discernment. The feeling we get, even from the Holy Spirit, is a warning, but it doesn't stop there. We must see it through to the Scripture if we're going to call it discernment. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it is a feeling. It is an impression. And it may be a right feeling. Don't get me wrong here. Don't hear me wrong. It may be accurate. But if we're going to call it discernment, we need to take it all the way to the Scripture. If you can't accurately describe it, uh, and it's just a feeling, and it may, then it may indeed be slander if you are wrong, or if you fail to explain why it is false, decisively and scripturally. Be a Berean. Be like Paul and John and Jesus. If you learn to do this, I promise you, you will not fail. And you will not be deceived. We also uh, do not do this in isolation. We have 2,000 years of church history and doctrine to help guide us. And we have the covering of the local church and one another in which to work these things out accurately together. Yes. Yes. It is much harder to deceive a large number of Bible-knowing and believing people than it is a single individual. Yes. You know that wolves prey on, on sheep that are weak? Mm -hmm. They look for the young, the diseased, the isolated, the vulnerable. Looks, uh, wolves look for the easy kill. Do not be a lone sheep away from the group and the shepherds. Lone sheep are a feast for the wolves. Yeah. I'm going to have the worship team come up. We're going to close the worship this morning. I'm just going to share with you guys a handful of warning signs once more. If you want to write these down, these are, these are really good things just to use as a guide. As a guide. I'm going to mention them one last time. Number one. The greatest deceivers will come from a quote unquote <laughs> Christian background. They will call themselves Christian, right? The great deceivers will call themselves Christians. Number two, they'll deny the biblical Lord Jesus in some way. That's really important because they'll use the name of Jesus. But what is it the biblical Lord Jesus that we're talking about? Because there are many false religions and false people who have created a Jesus that is not the Jesus of the Bible. Now listen, friends, if it's not the Jesus of the Bible, it's not a Jesus who can save either, because it's a false Jesus, a false Christ. Jesus warns that many false Christs will come. That's not just people that stand up and say, look at me, I'm the second coming Christ, follow me. It's also false Christs that are created that lead people astray. So they will somehow deny the biblical Lord Jesus in some way. Three, they will become very popular, and especially, especially with emotionally motivated people. And if you're an emotional, motivated person today, let me just say, that's not a bad thing. I think one of the most powerful things is when we allow the emotions of, uh, of our souls to worship <coughs> Jesus in spirit and in truth. Isn't that amazing? Yes. This morning, I was brought to tears by that video in Somalia and the believers and what they do. It's not wrong to be emotionally motivated. 
But we need to be careful because they will be very, very popular and they will attempt to manipulate by emotion and experience. Number four, they'll degrade doctrines of the Bible. Or they will claim that those doctrines of the Bible, which have been there throughout all of Christendom and have stood the test of time, they will somehow say that those are now wrong or outdated, or they have a new version of truth. And if they're claiming to have a new version of truth or something that you can only know once you experience, friends, that's Gnosticism. It's condemned long ago. John deals with it in his epistle. Paul and Peter both deal with it. It wasn't anything new. This has been going on from the beginning. People who claim to have secret knowledge, and they may even say things like this, don't listen to your pastor because you can only know this once you've experienced it. I watched something like that this week. It was very, very disturbing to me because they went on to teach things that were very, very wrong. But they used the name of Jesus freely and they warned people uh, and claimed that they had special knowledge and you had to get that special knowledge from people just like them. That's a sure sign of the deceiver people. Last but not least, it will stimulate greed to attract followers. Some of the ministries that we're talking about are some of the most financially rich ministries in the world. Why? Because they are selling something that, that people want to hear and that, uh, and that people will pay money for, hoping that they can receive something instead of receiving Jesus. They will, uh, they will attempt to manipulate the greed of our culture and the greed that is in many people in order to, uh, to fit and to suit their needs. We're going to close there this morning looking at the time. We've gone long enough as it is. But I hope this morning that this is a good introductory teaching from what we can then springboard into as we talk about some more specific things. And I'm actually going to use some very real examples of some things that are going on right now that are deceiving many, many people, which have roots that aren't even of God, that go all the way back to the occult and to the demonic. We're going to do that. But here's the important thing. The important thing isn't to touch on every one of these ministries and, and every movement, because if we did that, you'd be dependent upon me teaching you all those different things. What actually matters is that we learn what the scripture says to be true, and we then learn to filter these things through that. That that becomes our test of knowing whether something or not is uh, whether or not something is true. And so that's the real challenge is for us to be good students of the word together, to grow in our knowledge of the word, so that we won't be deceived by the next thing that pops up. Because surely it will, should Jesus tarry any longer than he already has. There will be more false Christs and false prophets and false uh, 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 gospels that creep up. It happens almost on a weekly basis at this point. In the last five to ten years, it has amplified. And we want to be able to be people of the Word, who are also people of the Spirit, and bring together the discernment of the Holy Spirit with the Word of God. The fusion of the Word of God and the Spirit is a thing that will lead to the greatest outpouring of revival in any of our lives or any of the people around us. So let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for the seriousness of this topic, that you address it here near the end of the Sermon on the Mount as you were speaking to your disciples and, and to those who were listening on. And Lord, I believe this is one of the most important parts of, of the teaching on the Sermon on the Mount that we need to hear as disciples in, in the 21st century where these things are happening all around us and, and we see them every single day. We hear them every single day. We may not even recognize some of those things, but they are happening all around us. And so, Father, I want to pray this morning that you would continue to, uh, to prick our hearts. And, Lord, that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear the scriptures you are speaking to us. And, Lord, that you would indeed increase the discernment that we have, not just the, by giving us the Holy Spirit who leads us into all truth and warns us when we hear these things spoken. We say, I don't think that's right. But then, Lord, we would be able to complete that and we would be able to go to the scripture and say, aha, this is where it falls short. These are the things that are doing it. Oftentimes, it's very, very subtle. But God, all bad trees eventually bear bad fruit. So, Lord, I pray that you will teach us not to be judgmental, critical people who are going around everywhere just trying to judge and criticize everything. But, Lord, we will be wise people who use discernment and who help protect the work that you are doing in us, in our kids, in our families, in our church, and Lord, in those around us. And Lord, as we uh, uh, obey this call to go and make disciples of our city and of all nations, Lord, that we will be able to teach accurately the things that Jesus taught. And Lord, we will be able to create disciples who themselves 
are inoculated from the deceptions of this age. Because we teach them also to love your word and to know your word. Thank you, Jesus. In, in your name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Church, let's stand as we close and let's sing this song one more time that we sang earlier today. And let's take a moment and just worship the ancient of days for who he is. Amen.